And yes, I really think uh, that it is Alice in Wonderland in a post-apocalyptic way with a man with no arms and legs in a cybernetic cart being pulled by a cow. What else can you want? <laughs> it's incredible. Hello everyone and welcome to another video by Liminal Spaces. I am really jazzed today because I am bringing you another book that I feel I can recommend with absolutely no qualms. Uh, this is one of the most trippy psychedelic books I've read in a long time. It's a post-apocalyptic book which is always fun. I love post-apocalyptic books and this one really doesn't let you down at all. And the book, of course, is Deus I Ray by Philip K. Dick and Roger Zelazny. This book is really interesting to me because it seems like it's been forgotten. And I know that's not 100% the case. I see it talked about every now and again. Uh, it's even come up in the comments of our videos already. But when I started collecting and reading all the Philip K. Dick I could find, uh, this one never came up. And it's probably because it's a collaboration, so people aren't as interested in the collaborations as they are his other stuff. And I don't think it's his only collaboration. I don't know if this is his only collaboration, but uh, it's the only one that I know of. And that might be one of the reasons that it's often left out of his bibliography. Not on the web pages, of course, but just in the general discussion of Philip K. Dick. Uh, I, of course, was very much excited when I saw this collaboration, Zelazny and Dick. I uh, have loved Philip K. Dick for a long time. Roger Zelazny is completely new to me. I had just read his first novel um, a couple of, uh, about a month ago, I think. And uh, it was truly mind expanding stuff. So I was really excited to see that these two had collaborated on a novel together. And I was very happy uh, when it turned out that it was also an incredible read. Okay, before we get into the story itself, I wanted to just give a quick background on how this book came to be. Uh, Dick started this novel in the mid 60s, a uh, very productive uh, time for him. He was he had rented a shack outside his house and would leave the house during the day to go write. Um, the novel that I know of that I liked the best that came out of it, uh, of this era was the three uh, stigmata of Palmer Eldritch, which I believe this book is working through. Uh, a few of these of uh, quite a few similar ideas as that one um, so I'm not surprised that it came from the same era uh, it was during that era that uh, Philip K. Dick had a vision in the clouds of Palmer Eldritch that he, he said it was God and he had these uh, mechanical eyes um, and he even kind of flirted with the Christian church at that time becoming Christian for a bit trying to learn about Christianity uh, and I think that this is another attempt at him to try to figure that out. And I have no idea whether Palmer Eldritch was, was written before this. We don't know exactly when Dick started this. I'm assuming, and I'm just assuming that it was afterward, but I have no evidence to back that up. So that's just pure conjecture that this was started afterwards. Anyway, Dick started this novel uh, and was kind of wrestling with these ideas and he brought in a couple of short stories that he'd written uh, and took some of the ideas from those and was really kind of creating this look of religion, look at religion in, in post-apocalyptic times. Uh, and he felt as he was writing that perhaps he didn't know enough about Christianity to be able to finish this book. So he set it aside and he stopped working on it. However, Doubleday had already paid him in advance to do it, so he couldn't just ignore it completely. So what he did was decide to make it a collaboration, and the person that he decided he wanted to collaborate with was the editor and author, Ted White. So he gave the manuscript to Ted White, who looked at it and put it aside. We do not know why Ted White 
didn't work on this. We don't know why he put it aside. I don't know if he didn't want to be part of the collaboration. I don't know if he didn't like the work. Uh, I have no idea. All we can do is speculate, but for whatever reason, Ted White did not work uh, on this at all. He just left it sitting in his house. Later, in 1968, Roger Zelazny went over to Ted White's house and found the manuscript sitting there. And he started flipping through it and really enjoyed it and decided that he wanted to collaborate with Dick on this project. So he uh, called up Philip K. Dick and said, hey, do you want to collaborate with me on this? Uh, and uh, PKD was like, yeah, that sounds great. Uh, so they started collaborating. And it was very sporadic collaboration. They would write on it for a bit, send it back and forth, and then one of the uh, one of the other would forget, be working on different stuff, and it would just sit there for long periods of time. Uh, in fact, it was so ignored that at one point, Roger Zelazny's cat urinated on the manuscript. But eventually, Doubleday had had enough, and they said, look, uh, either you give us the manuscript completed or you give us the money back that we gave to Philip K. Dick, the advance, when he first started writing this. Of course, they didn't want to do that, so the book got finished up uh, pretty quick after that. They both focused their attention on it, I'm sure, uh, and got it finished up. Uh, and they sent the manuscript, but they were nice enough to photocopy the pages that, uh, that had cat urine on them. And when Doubleday received the manuscript, they saw that some of the pages were copied. And it was a very strict policy for Doubleday back then that they received the original manuscript. So they got back a hold of Zelazny and said, this will not cut it. You absolutely need to uh, send us those uh, original pages. So he did. He took the cat urine pages and, and sent them in the mail. And he's often wondered... Uh, exactly what it was like for that editor to open those page, uh, open that envelope and find those pages. But anyway, uh, from the urine-soaked original comes an incredible, uh, strange tale of the uh, of post-apocalyptic America, specifically uh, the Southwest of America, and this is one of the strongest post-apocalyptic novels I've read and a collab that I was super excited about. So let's get into the story. So I'll break this video into three parts. The first part I'm going to do is basically a look at uh, all the things that happened before this novel opens. All the what we call ground situation uh, that exists before the novel opens. Um, so this is America in the Southwest, like I said. Um, Right after 1982, the world is destroyed by a uh, nuclear war and the planet's surface is irradiated to the extent that people can barely survive. Of course, all societies uh, fall. A lot of knowledge is lost. Uh, not all scientific knowledge, but a chunk of it is. However, when this novel opens, people are beginning to organize themselves once more into societies. And they are they're creating little towns that are isolated from one another. There's not any type of global or uh, really any type of easily accessible communication. Uh, they do have radio technology, and we learn about that later in the book, but... Uh, these these communities are small and isolated. After the complete destruction of the planet, a new religion forms. And this religion worships the man that helped invent and triggered the last weapon that has really contaminated and destroyed the surface. And uh, this this bomb is very strange because it's lots of little like drone things that fly through the air and just contaminate the air. Like the whole purpose of this weapon is to just say, forget it. I'm going to make this planet unlivable for humans all the way around. Uh, it is a disgusting, disgusting weapon. Uh, and the religion that forms around the man that, that triggered and helped invent this weapon uh, they call him the God of Wrath, that he is the embodiment of the God of Wrath. And it's a very interesting idea because 
they decide, I mean, the whole planet, of course, goes through this grief after the war, at least the survivors do. Um, and while Christianity is still in existence and they still, uh, of course, know about Christianity, none of them can really accept it right after the war because Christianity preaches of a kind and loving God and everything around them uh, is only proof of an angry, destructive God. So Christianity falls away and this new religion uh, the uh, the God of Wrath, and I think they're called Servants of Wrath or Sowers, become the kind of the main religion of of all these small communities. But there are still Christians holding on, and as society kind of rebuilds, these Christians um, start to cement more of a place for themselves, and and they're even growing a tiny bit, although nowhere near the. Uh, believers of the god of wrath uh so this man that they worship as the uh embodiment of the god of wrath his name is carl carlton luftiful i have no idea if i pronounced that correctly um but his last name translates from german directly as air devil um so, however you pronounce that i'm sorry if i uh, didn't pronounce it well he is still out there. Um, he could be one of the survivors. In fact, they I think they have intel that they believe he absolutely is still alive. They just don't know where he is or what he's doing. So that's where we open. We open in this world and we open in a tiny town in Utah called Charlottesville. And we are introduced to our main character and his name is Tiber McMasters. And he is what is called by this society an ink. And ink is short for incomplete. So the radiation uh, has caused him to be born without arms and legs. Uh, and when I first started reading this and realizing that our uh, main character was an ink, I was so excited and blown away uh, because it's, it is such an, a unique and interesting character that I was so excited to see how he was going to go on this journey. Uh, and what they've done is he has a cart and some genius and post-war technology genius has put together this cart for him that has a battery with that lasts for a really long time. And this cart that he sits in gives him cybernetic arms that he can control he controls them with his brain so he's able to move them around like his hands and his arms um so he has this amazing technological cart that allows him a, a ton of freedom but it's pulled around by a cow and it just has kind of regular trailer wheels on this cart and i love this juxtaposition uh between kind of the mundane after war technology of of the the means of the cart getting around uh opposed to the incredibly advanced scientific arms uh that come out of the cart that he's able to use as his own uh it's it's really kind of an awesome statement of of what we can keep and what we can't keep um, once humanity is, is wiped to a certain extent. Really, really enjoyable. And he uses his cybernetic arms to paint. He is considered the greatest painter in the area, uh, which is not a huge area, Charlottesville, Utah. And he is a, a servant of wrath, uh, and he is painting a mural for them. And he's painted all these different parts of the mural, but it's come to a point where the mural is going to depict Carlton... Uh, the God of Wrath, the guy that invented and triggered the weapon. And they have a little picture of him, but you can't really see his face very well in it. And so he can't, he says, I can't really paint from this. And they say, okay, you have to go on a pilg, which is a pilgrimage. And you need to find the God of Wrath and take his picture, a really nice picture, and then you can paint him into this mural. And this is kind of the story of his re reluctance, but his bravery to go on this journey to find the god of wrath 
The other main character that we are introduced to soon after is a man named Pete Sands. Pete Sands is a Christian, and he's part of the really dwindling faith there in Charlottesville. And his character is really unique. And he's, he Pete is actually the first character that I really connected to. Pete likes to sort through the wreckage that has been left from the war. And the war created all these toxic chemicals that they would release to befuddle or poison the enemy. And he likes to collect these toxic chemi chemicals, mix and match them, and take them. Uh, and he's kind of become this seer, this vision seer, that believes that he can see God when he gets these uh, concoctions right. Uh, and this is where a lot of the, the real psychedelic aspects of this book come through. And the visions are written beautifully. Of course they are. I believe that this part is probably part of the core that Philip K. Dick had already written. Uh, but I'll get into that in the deep dive uh, that I do after this video. So Pete is asked by the higher-ups in his church to follow Tiber. But they don't give him any instructions of whether he's supposed to protect Tiber or kill Tiber, or stop Tiber from meeting the God of Wrath. Uh, so he, he, he just knows that he's supposed to go with him. Uh, so he's constantly in his brain trying to figure out what he's supposed to do. That's the first part of the book. The rest of the book is this pilgrimage. And this is when it gets wild. And I love the first part, but man, this this second part is absolutely incredible because it in my mind really is kind of an homage to Alice in Wonderland, right? They leave Charlottesville, the normalness that they're used to, um travel through this kind of well, I'll say liminal desert space and they end up in another world it's wild they meet an ai that is still running from before the war and that now demands human sacrifice every year they meet mutant sentient lizards and bugs that they have conversations with uh, he finds himself eventually going to a, a, an underground russian auto factory that that is an automated uh, basically an automated mechanic uh, but has also gone kind of wonky over all the years. Um, yeah, I don't want to give any more spoilers other than that. Absolutely uh, incredible journey that Tiber goes through, meeting all of these strange people. And yes, I really think uh, that it is Alice in Wonderland in a post-apocalyptic way with a man with no arms and legs in a cybernetic cart being pulled by a cow. What else can you want? <laughs> it's incredible. And the plot is absolutely incredible. It has a twist at the ending that I did not see coming and just had me jumping out of my seat. Uh, I absolutely loved the uh, ending of this novel. I'm not going to give any more away, but I will say, if you plan on reading this, do not read any plot summaries. You will ruin it for yourself. Uh, come at this blind. Don't read any summaries. The characters are wonderfully written, both by uh, Dick and Zelazny. Uh, the only problem that I had with this book, one, one problem, and of course I'll go into this a lot in my deep reading, uh, but just for this video, the only problem I had is that Pete Sands did not seem like the same character at the beginning of the book as he was at the end of the book. And I don't know if it's because they wanted a different take on him or if because um, Zelazny wrote one part and Dick wrote the other. Um, I don't know what happened there, but it's really the only negative that I can give an otherwise really uh, incredible novel. And most importantly, like all the novels that I love, this one has a dog in it. That's not true. Not every novel I, I love has a dog in it, but um, 
I've found recently the novels I've really been enjoying have dogs in them, and this one has a dog in it, and the dog does play a crucial role in the plot, which I really love. Uh, unfortunately, this one's not a talking dog like the last one, but still, dogs are very rare in this world, so it's very cool to see a dog nonetheless. Again, you should absolutely check out this book. Uh, now I have to rate it. I thought a lot about this. I would have to give uh, Deus Irae a 9 it would be a perfect 10, but there's a part of this, the novel that felt a little repetitive and also the fact that I couldn't uh, really connect Pete Sands from the beginning of the book to the end of the book. I, 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 they didn't seem exactly like the same character, so that knocks it down. We're still talking a 9 here. It's absolutely incredible. Go grab it. Hopefully this won't do the same thing that happened with Roger, Roger Zelazny's um, The Dream Master, which... I did one of my last videos on and now the prices are all skyrocketing and it's hard to find them. Uh, but if it does and you want to read this, go grab it fast. I was able to get a first edition copy for really cheap. So uh, go see what you can find out there. All right. If you like this video, please click like. If you like this kind of content, please subscribe. We'll be doing a lot of it in the future. And thank you very much for watching.